distribute them sometime this week and um, that would be really wonderful. Those inv invitations to our carol services next Sunday with a message as well and also a little thing to, to fill in if you want more information. We've also got loads and loads of these uh, magazines to, to take uh, for yourself, to give away to friends. Again, they're outside in the foyer. Just take a handful if you want them, as long as you give them out to friends and family, that would be great. They need to be used, and they've got all sorts of articles and puzzles and things in there which are really good. Right, if you have a Bible with you, it's time for our Bible reading. And we're going to read from uh, the book of Acts, chapter 16, and we're going to read from verse 6 through to verse 10. Acts chapter 16, from verse 6 through to verse 10. Let's hear the word of the Lord. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of, the Lord, of Jesus did not allow them. So, passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the, in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately... We sought to go on to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So reads God's word. Continuing the angels and the shepherds, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. A new carol that we learned, I think, last year, but we sang it again last week. We'll reinforce it again. What God has laid on your heart, and Stan prayed just before we left the room this morning. He says, Lord, just as you called Paul to go to Macedonia. I don't know why he remembers praying it, but I thought, wow. Now, that sounds good to me, because I thought, this is what God wants me to share this morning. And I put a little title on what I want to speak on this morning is... A cry for help. Whenever we go to Africa, and sometimes whenever we're ready to leave Africa, often the children will come to us, and the question they ask is, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? And uh, we often say, we'll be back next year. On one occasion, we were on an island called Bovuma, just off uh, Uganda, on Lake Victoria. And uh, we were there doing children's ministry, and the little school, primary school, the, the headmaster came to us when we went on our first, uh, our first visit to the island. And we did some ministry with the boys and girls. And the headmaster came and says, when are you coming back? And we said, we'll be back next year. And here was, this was his comment. That's what the last group said. But they never came back. They never came back. Well, thank God we fulfilled that plan and that promise, and we've been back, we've been back four or five times uh, since that particular time in the land uh, of, of Uganda and on Bavuma Island. And uh, it's quite primitive, very primitive. There's no running water, there's no flush toilets. Uh, it gets dark very quickly, and uh, well, it's just different. Let's just put it like that. And sometimes people say, why do you do it? And we just say, the love of Christ constrains us. And, and that should be the heart of every one of, of God's people. We should have a love that constrains us to do something for Jesus whenever we become born-again believers in the Lord Jesus. Paul and Silas were on their second missionary journey, and they were doing a tremendous work for the Lord. And God was blessing their ministry. They were called of God to spread the gospel of Jesus, the risen Savior. And Paul was a tremendous outspoken uh, a preacher, and we know that from what we read in the, in, in the scriptures. But Paul had his, had his mind set where he was heading for and what he was for doing. And it's amazing how the Holy Spirit of God steps in and changes Paul's direction. Paul's ready to go off to a place called uh, 
Bethiah. And, and as he's heading off to, wanting to go to this place, it says the Spirit of God comes and appears to him and tells him he's not to go there. He's not heading in that direction. And so he has his mind set as a, as a preacher, as a, as a believer, as, a, as the apostle, servant of God, to go in a certain direction. And God steps in by the power of the Holy Spirit and changes his course, changes his direction. And sometimes we're not good at changing direction, especially if we've got a mindset that we feel we're on the right course. Uh, and we don't like changing direction. And sometimes we don't like change. And if we don't change, sometimes we're forced to change and then we get angry about it because it wasn't what we expected. And Paul has is, is set his mind to go in a certain direction. The Spirit of God moves in and says, Paul, I've got something different for you. I have another direction for you to go in. And Paul, this is the direction you're going to go in. Paul goes into a, an evening for, for his evening sleep, as it were. And as he's having this lovely sleep during the night, um, it says in verse 9 of chapter 16, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man. Paul is awakened out of his sleep by a vision of a man who he can see in Macedonia. And the man in Macedonia is saying to him, Paul, we need help. Come over and help us. And Paul had to think about it for a moment or two, but he knew God was in this. He knew God was directing this. And he had his mindset with Silas to go in a certain direction. But God gave him a new vision. I wonder this morning, as Christians, as a church, is God going to give you a new vision? A vision of the lost. A vision of the needy. A vision of children in your community. Now, I'm here this morning and I've listened to what you've done this past week. And so I sort of feel, well, why am I saying this? You've had hundreds of children come through the church. And you're reaching out and you're missionary minded. But here's Paul getting a vision, a fresh vision from God. He thought the vision he had was okay. But God says, I have another vision. And it's a better one. And it's going to be blessed. And Paul, this is the road you need to go. This is the direction now I want you to take. What is your vision? What's your vision for the next year? What's your vision for life? What's your vision for, for serving God in the local church or maybe overseas? Do you have a vision? When you get up in the morning, do you say, now this is what I'm going to do because this is what I've planned. And God comes along here and he, he speaks through a vision. You know, whenever you read of tremendous missionaries of old, they were given visions from God because they were in touch with God. If you take the like of William Carey, William Carey was given a vision of multitudes, multitudes of people who needed to hear the gospel. And William Carey took the gospel to India with his millions of people and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. David Livingston was given a vision and he went to, to Africa. And when he, came, when he got to Africa, he had been given a vision of teeming millions of Africans who needed to hear the gospel. When he went there, William Carey, David Livingston, Hudson Taylor saw the teeming billions in China. And God called him. God put in the heart of these men a vision to reach lost people. What is your vision this morning? Maybe it's time to ask God, God, I need a new vision. I need a fresh vision. I need a vision of the lost that's out there. Just like William Carey or David Livingston or Hudson Taylor. I read the story and I was so moved when I read the story of David Livingston. David Livingston was so touched by God's call and God's vision that David Livingston's heart became Africa's heart. And here's what it says. When David Livingston came back to die, there was only one request. 
that his heart would be removed and sent back to be buried in Africa. And it was. The heart of David Livingston, a pioneer missionary's heart, was sent to Africa to be buried. Such was his vision and his passion for the people of Africa. Is that our passion? Is that our passion today for Liverpool? For the teeming thousands of people who need to hear the gospel? Not only was David, or, or sorry, not only was Paul given this vision, but Paul was open to a voice. He heard a voice. It says here that there came a vision. There stood a man in Macedonia speaking, saying, Come over into Macedonia. And help us. He not only has now seen the vision of a crowd of people. And a world in need. But he's heard the voice. And this voice, this voice is crying. Come and help us. Come and help us. And Paul is so moved by what he's hearing to come and help us. He thinks to himself. I need to go. I cannot but go. To Macedonia. You know, the cry of the world today is still the same. The people of Africa, India, the Eskimos, the Japanese, the people from Ireland, the people from Britain, the people from Mexico, the people from wherever you want to put this morning are crying, come and help us. Come and help us. And Paul's answer was very simply, yes, we will go. I wonder this morning, is God speaking to you to go into ministry? Is God speaking to you maybe to join a team? To go somewhere to serve him? Is God speaking to you maybe to maybe, even in this church, to step forward to become a Sunday school teacher or a Bible class leader or, or in some of the organizations? And you've thought about it and thought about it, but your attitude has been, has been ah, someone else will do it. But those someone else are running out. And they need help. They need help. You know, I was watching part of the match last night when we got back. I, I'm not interested in football. And my wife, less. But I went upstairs last night. And while I was upstairs last night, just for about two minutes in Don and Marines, I couldn't believe what I heard. Here's what I heard. Yo, come on! And I goes, that's my wife's voice. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I says, let's, come, let's be coming an addiction. She has seen 10 minutes of football and the roar of that woman in that man, those people's home. You remember it? Of course you do. <laughs> I come down quietly and slipped in and I said, there must be something exciting going on here because my wife has really just scored a goal. Oh, she just, whatever. And I thought about this. Twenty men kicking a bag of wind. Two men trying to catch it. And my wife's mad. Mad, excited. When someone scored a goal. And I thought, shouldn't we get more excited about souls getting saved? Shouldn't we? We watch them on the pitch. I don't know what you were thinking. Have you watched it? But I'm not into football. But you know what I've seen? I've seen 20 men running after a ball, two men trying to catch it, and millions knowing how to play the game. <laughs> I think everybody probably up in the stands all knew how to play the game. But those poor fellas on that pitch, do you know what they wanted? They wanted rest. And everybody else needed to get out there and get some exercise. <laughs> But they were roaring and shouting and yelling for their team. You know, God's saying this morning, catch the vision. His voice is, go. The gospel begins with G-O. Go. And we need to be ready to go and share the gospel, whether it's here in the church or whether it's overseas. Why is our Bible colleges closing? 
Why are so few coming forward to serve the Lord in ministry? Has God stopped calling? I don't think so. I think we have stopped listening. We ha we're not hearing his voice clearly anymore. Maybe we need to just stop and pause and think, what does God want me to do? Paul has been given a vision. He has heard the voice. Now he has to obey that voice. And by obeying that voice, Paul pulls up anchor and it says, and after he's seen the vision, immediately he says, we endeavor to go into Macedonia, a surely gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Paul is now ready with Silas and says, Silas, we're not going to, to, to that place that we were speaking about last night. We're going now to, to Macedonia. And I think Silas must have thought for a moment and said, Paul, you got this right. Because he doesn't seem to have the vision or get it. But he's looking at this man, Paul, and he says, Paul says, yes, there's a man. I seen a man last night in my dream, my vision, and he's crying for help, and we must go. And off they sail to Philippi. They arrive in Philippi, not knowing what to do or where to go, but God has directed them. God has sent them. And as they arrive in Philippi, they begin to look around. And it says in verse 13, And on the Sabbath we went out uh, of the city by a river where prayer was wont to be made. And we, and we, and we sat down and, and we speak unto, unto women who had come to pray. And see, Paul and Silas now know that this is God sent us here, so we need to get out and do something. And they move around and they go to a, a riverside. And here's this group of women praying. And as they find this group of women praying... They begin to witness to these women. And it says on verse 14, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, she heard us, whose heart was opened by the Lord. God had already this great woman willing and ready to respond to the gospel, but she needed to hear someone bring it to her. And Paul is the messenger of Silas who comes along and shares the gospel of saving grace of a risen Savior. And Lydia opens up her heart and receives the gospel of Jesus Christ. And a church is planted in Philippi through this dear lady. She was a woman of wealth. She was a seller of purple. Purple was worn in those days, they tell us, by the magistrates. She was in high society. She was a woman who was looked upon of her background and what she was able to do and, 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 and her business life. But God steps into this woman's heart. Her heart is open to the gospel and she receives it with grace. One of this morning in church, you've been coming to church or maybe you're here for the first time this morning. Maybe something has been said that has opened your heart. And God wants to come and live in it through Jesus. Maybe this morning is an opportunity where God wants to come and just live in your life and become your savior. <coughs> These were tremendous victories for Paul and Silas. Because he saw a vision, he heard the voice, and God gives him victories. The victory of a woman of high society. He then moves around and the next thing he finds himself coming face to face with a woman who's demon possessed. And this woman is working for, 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 for her, her businessmen, whoever they were at the time. And this woman doesn't like what's going on. It says in verse 16 of chapter 16, And it came to pass that when we went to pray, a certain damsel possessed of a spirit of divination, she met us and she, she brought her, her masters much gain, much money by fortune telling. And this woman then begins to cry out to Paul and she calls him the most high servant of the Lord's. And Paul is getting so agitated with this woman because of her evilness and her background and what she's doing. And it's as if God is saying, Paul... I saved Lydia, a woman of high standing, high society, at the top of the letter. But Paul, 
This young girl's at the bottom of the letter. She's in the gutters of sin. She's, she's living on the door of hell. And Paul turns to this woman and he commands the evil spirit to come out of her. And in verse 18, the evil spirit comes out of the woman and this young damsel is wonderfully and gloriously saved. These are the triumphs of obedience to God. And I can just imagine, you know, this young woman who's known in the community as a fortune teller or whatever, when Paul introduced her to, to the house of Lydia and says, Lydia, here's another young lady who has given her life to Jesus. How is she welcomed? I think Lydia would have welcomed, welcomed her with open arms because now she's a believer. They didn't like what was happening in the community. The man that had lost a good worker. They take Paul and Silas. They beat them. They put them into prison. Their backs are bleeding. Do you know what's interesting? Paul and Silas did something that night that you and I would not do. At least I don't think I would. They were beaten because of preaching the gospel. But it says these men, in verse 25, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, and then they started to sing praises. I think, wow. <laughs> How can you praise the Lord and the, bleed, the blood's running down your back? But these men begin to praise God. But there's a prison officer, you see, he's come on night duty and there he's in the prison cell and Paul and Silas is in the inner cell and, 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 and stalks on their, on their legs, they can't move, but they be, begin to praise God. You see, Paul is seeing victories. Lydia's a victory. This damsel girl's a victory for Jesus. And now this man who has no interest in the gospel, no time for the gospel, hard as nails, Lying up, sleeping in his chair, thinking everything's good. Nobody can get out. Nobody can escape. And God shakes the land with a little earthquake. And suddenly the doors are wide open. And this man's awakened. Awakened out of his sleep. And the first thought he has, I'm, I, I'm a dead man. Because I have fallen asleep on my work. These, so, these prisoners have all got out. And when the Roman authorities come in here, they're going to put me to death for this. And it says he took a sword and he was going to kill himself. The man was going to commit suicide there and then because he thought, this life's not worth living. Can I ask you this morning, how many people who are outside the doors of this church this morning who would say exactly the same? Life is not worth living. I can't cope. I can't hack it anymore. I just can't take any more. And Paul and Silas is there. And the, as this man was about to take his own life, Paul and Silas, these guys who have been praising the Lord, turned around and said to the man, don't, don't do yourself any harm. In verse 28, don't do it. Everybody's still here. The man couldn't believe it. Everybody's still here. Whew. What did he do? He went running into the cell where Paul and Silas were. Because I believe this man heard the prayers and the praises of two saints. In the midst of torture, they still showed Jesus. And as they showed Jesus, this man went in and with the wonderful question, what must I do to get saved? Maybe you're in church for the first time. How many people have walked into church for the first time, lost, and walked out a believer in Jesus? That man got gloriously and wonderfully saved. He took Paul and Silas back to the house. And you know how he proved his salvation? He washed their, he washed their wounds. He showed that tremendous work of grace, and he washed their wounds. That's the victory in serving Jesus. The victory of three precious souls. One from high society, one from the bottom of society, and just an ordinary working class man. 
And that tells me this morning, Jesus loves everyone. It doesn't matter where you live or where you're from or what you have or what you don't have. His mercy is for everyone. We need help. We need help. That was the cry that came to Paul. Paul, come and help us. If God puts it on your heart to help, don't walk away. If Paul had walked away from the voice that he was given that day, he would have never reached Lydia, the demon possessed, or the man in prison. But because he obeyed the voice, went through with the vision, he saw the victories. And you can see them as well. And if God has spoke to you this morning, and God has dealt with you, if you're not saved, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, why don't you why don't you sort it out today? This could be a great Christmas, wonderful Christmas. This could be the Christmas when you really celebrate Jesus as your Savior. And if you are a Christian, maybe God needs to give you a new vision just to open your eyes and to see the lost, like Hudson Taylor or William Carey or, or David Livingston. Where are these men today? I don't mean those men, but where are the David Livingstons? Where are the William Careys? Where are the Hudson Taylors? Where are they? Surely God still makes them. But where are they? Maybe there's one in Bethel today. Maybe there's one. Tommy, thank you. That was a challenging word for us all today, wasn't it? If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour, then don't leave it. Don't walk out the door before you've made your peace with him. He loves you, and as Tommy's told us this morning, his mercy is sufficient for you, from the greatest to the least.